Ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to the 2013 um, Oppenheimer uh, Lecture. This um, lecture was established by the IISS with the support of uh, Nikki Oppenheimer to give an important annual platform to an African leader drawn from the worlds of politics, business, or academia to offer new perspectives on the African geopolitical and geoeconomic condition. We naturally take every opportunity to expose our global audience to the viewpoints of Africans, and we wish increasingly to devote much more research efforts to the continent. We recently, for example, held an important geoeconomic conference in the Middle East on the growing links between the Gulf and Africa. We cover carefully through our armed conflict database all the conflict that occurs in Africa. The Institute assesses the defense economics of African states in its annual military balance and reviews African political trends in its strategic survey. We have frequent strategic comments on African issues and have an ongoing research program on insurgency, organized crime, and drugs in West Africa and the Sahel. And we are increasingly examining energy security issues uh, as they relate to Africa, and we're keenly following ways in which economic development supports political stability and social inclusiveness. The Oppenheimer Lecture was specifically designed to invite an authoritative perspective on a key theme related to African security and development. Today, I am certain that we will have just such an address. In fact, our speaker has chosen as a title for her lecture Securing Development, Challenges of Economic Inclusion. The first time I heard the phrase securing development was in September 2008, when the then president of the World Bank delivered a keynote address to the IISS Global Strategic Review entitled Fragile States Securing Development, a speech published in Survival in December of that year. There are, of course, different ways in which the phrase securing development can be interpreted, and I expect that in the internal debates that will have taken place at the time, Dr. Ngozo Kongo Iwala, then a managing director of the World Bank, will have played a central intellectual role in shaping thinking. Now, coordinating Minister for the Economy and Minister of Finance, or CME for short, <laughs> of Nigeria. Dr. Iwala is back in charge of what is now soon to be, no doubt, the largest economy in Africa, having first been Minister of Finance in 2003 to 2006, during which he brokered a deal for the cancellation of $18 billion of Nigerian debt and eventually uh, the elimination of the $30 billion it then held. Aside from these government postings and her many roles at the World Bank, she has served as a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution, authored books, and stimulated debate on development economics and good governance. She has been recognized both as a major intellectual figure and a determined and courageous politician. And so it's an honor and pleasure to invite her to deliver the 2013 Oppenheimer Lecture. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, John. And thanks to all of you uh, in the audience uh, for being here today. I'm deeply honored uh, by the invitation when I met John at the Munich Security Conference and we sat next to each other and we resolved after that we would uh, follow up and be in touch. I didn't really think it would result in anything. You know, you have these conversations at all these conferences and Everybody goes their way, but here we are today, uh, and it's resulted an, in an invitation to speak here at the Oppenheimer Lecture. And um, I'm more honored, even more so, by doc, uh, Dr. Chipman describing me uh, you know, as a courageous politician. In my country, they just think I'm a silly technocrat. <laughs> I feel also honored here today because my predecessors have been heads of state, so at least for a short while, I'll feel very presidential. <laughs> <laughs> Let me commend the IISS, which has been at the forefront of promoting global peace and security over the last few decades, and reiterate that the Institute's mission is ever pertinent in a world where change is the only consistent factor, and likewise, 
where the nature of threats to peace and security is ever changing. As John said in this context, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my lecture today is titled Securing Development, Challenges of Economic Inclusion in Africa. And I did borrow the uh, title, uh, you know, part of the title from what Bob Zelik said. I loved it when he ca came up with that phrase, and we did discuss it, but it is really his, um, that context, that concept of securing development. Now, what I want to discuss today is uh, uh, the, the challenges of inc economic inclusion in Africa, which discusses a rising phenomenon that I believe poses significant risks to peace, security, and the overall development of the continent and the world at large. In 2010, we, the world watched, and I'm sure all of you have heard this so many times now, now but we cannot forget the horror at one, how one man, young man's frustrations and his alienation from his society and exclusion from job opportunities set the Arab world on fire. Who would have believed that the actions of one young man could lead to the type of revolutions we saw? Similarly, we've recently seen angry youth on the streets of Europe, from Greece to Spain to Italy to Turkey, now to Brazil in Latin America. Some phenomenon is in the air from country to country, and we really need to pay attention to what this means. I'm not trying to imply that every demonstration in every country necessarily has the same roots uh, or will have the same end point, but there is a wind in the air uh, with regard to what is happening with young people uh, in, our con in our world, and we need to pay attention. Like other regions, Sub-Saharan Africa, too, has not escaped from the phenomenon of rising youth unemployment. According to the OECD and the African Development Bank, young people under the age of 25 make up slightly more than a third of the region's total labor force, but account for about 60% of total unemployment. On average, 72% of the youth population lives below the $2 a day poverty line, according to a World Bank survey. In my own country, Nigeria, about 63% of the population is under 25. Unemployment is about 24%, with youth unemployment around 37%. But this does not capture the phenomenon of underemployment, which is also uh, big. People selling things on the streets, uh, people doing work that doesn't really occupy uh, the, much of their time. And in the northeast of the country, where the Boko Haram is a problem, the level of unemployment is higher, particularly in, in Yoba and Borno states. Uh, where the government recently declared a state of emergency, they have one of the highest unemployment rates in the country. And of course, during the dry season in the north, there are lots of youth without uh, any employment, uh, uh, um, doing not much when the agricultural activity is normally low. And this is also uh, something which of, uh, is of great concern. Now, the high levels of unemployment often create a feeling of hopelessness and desperation among youth. And these are psychological variables that terrorist organizations use in recruiting their members. After all, an idle mind is the devil's workshop, as the famous proverb goes. So it's not surprising that sub-Saharan Africa has of recent come under the spotlight as a breeding ground for forms of terrorism with insurgency groups like Ansar al-Din in Mali and Boko Haram in the northern parts of my country, and the Cameroon and Niger. However, unlike other regions of the globe where this phenomenon of rising youth unemployment can be closely linked to economic downturns and slow GDP growth, Africa's economy has been thriving. It's been growing. In the past decade, the growth of sub-Saharan African economies, averaging about 5% per annum, has outpaced global growth of about 3% annually. Countries like Nigeria, Ghana, Angola, and Ethiopia have grown at 7% or higher on an annual basis over the last few years, and six of the 10 fastest growing economies of the world were in sub-Saharan Africa during this same period. This economic growth has largely been on the back of strong macroeconomic reforms being implemented in several countries, and on the back of a peace dividend that resulted from an end to protect, protracted civil wars of the 1980s and 1990s. As a result, Sub-Saharan Africa in the last few years has been 
a, a hotbed for foreign and intra-regional investment. Since the region offers the highest rate of return on investment, according to the McKinsey Global Institute. In fact, it appears that Africa no longer needs a hands up, as Nikki Oppenheimer has suggested. When he gave the first of these lecture series in 2005, Africa now needs a handshake, a partnership <laughs> in global development. So, why then is this region, which has been doing so well for more than a decade, experiencing this phenomenon of jobless growth. Why is it that the vast majority of our youth are yet to be included in this economic growth? My concern is that if this trend is not checked, its effect could arrest Africa's progress towards peace and security, and in so doing, disrupt our economic development, like the Civil War of the 80s and 90s. I believe the answers to these questions lie in a number of critical issues confronting the continent, which I would like to bring to the forefront. What a phenomenon, the way I want to phrase it, is that on the macro front, fundamentals are strong and things are good. But when you look at the microeconomic level, there are a lot of questions to be asked. So what are the challenges of economic inclusion? First, and why are we seeing this phenomenon? My first thesis is that the pattern of growth is highly unequal. In other words, growth, growth is fast, but inequality has increased. Take the case of Nigeria, Ethiopia, and South Africa, three fast-growing economies during the de decade. The latest World Bank data available shows that the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of inequality in income distribution among individuals, has worsened over the last decade. In Nigeria, the coefficient rose from 42.9 in 2004 to 48.8, where 100 implies perfect inequality. So the closer you are to 100, uh, the worse it is. Likewise, in Ethiopia, the coefficient rose from 30 in 2000 to 33.6 by 2011, not such a steep rise. In South Africa, the coefficient rose from 57.8 in 2000 to 63.1 in 2009. So inequality in South Africa is very high. Such disparity in inequality fuels social tensions and violence in the society. And this is why when we talk of GDP growth, and it's very popular in my country, to, the people don't even want to hear about GDP growth because they tell you, is, is it growth we are going to eat? <laughs> you know, and I literally had to explain what GDP growth meant on television the other day using different sizes of cake. So it's not that you don't want, you know, so I had a small cake with a certain number of people and I show that if you increase the people without increasing the size of the cake, uh, it's going to get tougher. And then you put the next size and the next size. Just to show that there's nothing wrong with GDP growth. There's everything right. It is the quality of that growth that we need to watch and the type of growth. If we stop growing, then we can't even begin to solve our problems. So it's this growth with increasing inequality that is a trend that I believe partly accounts for the phenomenon we see uh, of not creating enough jobs. Second, while it is true that economic growth is a prerequisite for job creation, the sources of growth may not be those that create many new jobs. African economies have not truly transformed, as several countries still depend, many countries still depend primarily on commodity exports and manufacturing and industrialization is low. Natural resources like oil and various minerals account for nearly a quarter of the region's GDP and continue to be a significant driver of growth on the continent. Africa benefited greatly from the surge in global commodity prices in recent years. For example, oil prices climbed from less than $20 a barrel in 1999. I'm not sure people can even remember that oil prices were that low, you know, as recently as 1999-2000 to more than $145 per barrel in 2008. Gold prices rose from an average of $363 an ounce a decade ago to $1,371 per ounce today. Copper from $1,779 per metric ton in 2003 to $7,059 today. Africa's natural resources output is set to increase as new oil deposits are being discovered in countries like Ghana, Uganda, Kenya, gas in Tanzania, Mozambique. 
while the extraction of other minerals like iron ore is said to accelerate in countries like Guinea and Sierra Leone and Liberia. The IMF projects that oil exporting countries in sub-Saharan Africa will experience a relatively stronger growth on average of about 6.6% in 2013, higher than the region's overall growth rate of 5.4%. However, in spite of contributions to economic growth, the natural resources sector is not labor intensive, does not generate sufficient jobs to minimize the impact of this jobless growth phenomenon. As I said earlier, Manufacturing activity, which can potentially create millions of jobs across Africa, is still quite low. In fact, sub-Saharan Africa's share of manufacturing GDP is declining, and it's less than half of the average of all developing countries. The third explanation for this phenomenon of rising unemployment and jobless growth is that our human capital is inadequate, as there is a mismatch between the demand and supply, between demand and supply in our labor markets. On the one hand, the ILO estimates that about 133 million young people in Africa, or 50% of its youth population, are, un are uneducated and lack the basic skills to be competitive in the labor force. On the other hand, even those who are educated continue to work in low product productivity jobs, mostly in the informal sector of the economy because of their inadequate skills level. According to the African Development Bank, about 5 million graduates are produced annually by African universities, but the mismatch between the skills they have acquired and those required by the private sector to create sustainable jobs is fueling a phenomenon of the educated unemployed. Fourth, we have no safety nets, mm -hmm. and this leaves the unemployed highly vulnerable to poverty. In many countries, the information required to better target the poor and the unemployed is not available. We lack sound identification data and biometrics that can support safety nets. We lack effective tax systems that can help redistribute income in favor of those at the bottom end of the ladder. Fifth, Africa has a demographic challenge, its youth bulge. According to the UN population statistics, the median age on the continent is 19.7 years compared with 27.6 in Latin America and the Caribbean, 29 in Asia, 37 in North America, and 40 in Europe. So Europe is a very old <laughs> continent. <laughs> Nearly 70% of the continent's population is aged below 25. As a result, Africa's labor force has been growing strongly, expanding by 91 million over the past decade, Yet, only 37 million of the new entrants were employed in wage-paying jobs, according to the McKinsey Global Institute. With yet a very high fertility rate and its demographic composition, Africa's labor force is projected to rise by 122 million between 2010 and 2020, creating a continent-wide labor force of 500 million by the end of the decade. Clearly, this raises this challenge of job creation. And whilst jobs are being created, we do not say that no jobs are being created with the growth, but it is clear they are not being created fast enough to absorb the millions of new entrants into the labor force. Well, I've reeled off a series of the challenges and explanations for why I think we're experiencing this jobless growth. But I'm still optimistic about the Africa's future and the potential of its youth. I believe the region can continue on its fast growth trajectory and turn around this trend of jobless growth into job fuel growth, and by so doing, tackle the imminent threat to peace, security, and development on the continent. So what do I mean by this? How do we solve the problem? We need to act fast and act smart. We need to mainstream youth employment as a core strategic objective of development, and we need to tackle issues raised with both short and long-term solutions. Let me say a little bit about these solutions. First, it is necessary that Africa's economy continues to grow, like I said before, and even faster, if possible in the double digits, to keep pace with population growth and the growth of the labor force. And to ensure this, we must look beyond the reliance on primary commodity exports and natural resources. So I'm saying we cannot be complacent. You know, there's a lot on Africa rising now, you know, the economy's title. And it's good, and we're excited. But I'm also afraid it will lead to two things, you know, forgetting where we came from 
and also the fact that this may not be enough. We must diversify our economies by focusing on alternative sources of growth and job creation. We need to add value to agriculture and other commodities. We need to develop manufacturing and petrochemicals and other sectors that can grow our economy faster. We need to intensify efforts at improving our investment climate to ensure that the private sector can thrive and create jobs. In this regard, it is important that we fill the infrastructure gap which is costing the African economy at, two, at least two percentage points in GDP growth annually. We need to join hands with the private sector and invest proceeds of our natural resources in critical infrastructure like power, roads, rail, information and communications technology, water and sanitation. We need to develop our financial systems to provide flexible and timely credit. We need to develop capacity for entrepreneurship, especially among the youth as a major driver of job creation. Like in a number of other, other African countries, we in Nigeria have got this message. In fact, it is the main thrust of our transformation agenda. Oftentimes, people ask me, what keeps you or the president awake at night? With what keeps us awake at night and what we believe is a great vulnerability of our economic growth and development at this stage is the issue of youth unemployment. For that reason, we are focusing on high, on value-added agriculture, where we expect to create 3.5 million jobs by 2015. And just as an example, you know, President Goodluck Jonathan gave a midterm report of what his administration had been able to achieve after two years. And we are not very good at communicating uh, what is being, the government is doing. And people were quite surprised. You take agriculture, for instance, we spent $10 billion importing food that we could perfectly well grow in the country. We were the second largest ex importer of rice after the Philippines, and we became the largest. But we can grow rice in so many places, parts of the country. So we've turned to that, to import substitute. And just now, for the first time, we grew uh, dry season rice across 10 states in the north of the country. We produced a million, just 1.07 million metric tons of rice for the first time. And all those youths in the north who were not having anything to do, um, you know, were able to work in, 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 in the rice fields. And this was a very wonderful thing. This is not even counting what will happen with paddy. And our goal is to produce about 4.3 million metric tons by 2015. And with the performance we just did. We're well on the way. And of course, to be able to mill the rice, to bag the rice. So even those who have bagging companies are saying that they've doubled and tripled output just with, with this, and they've created uh, many more jobs. We are also looking at other sectors like housing. In Nigeria, we've never seen, I'm just using my country as an example, but in many African countries, we've not seen the housing sector as one that can be a driver for growth. But when I was, uh, if you live in the U.S., you see how the Case-Shiller Index and housing stats are watched every month like a hawk. It's not because they are just interested in people housing themselves. It's because this is a key driver of economic growth in the U.S. But we've never really thought through that in any of our countries. In Malaysia, uh, in, prior to the East Asian crisis in 1990, so I was country director for Malaysia and some other East Asian countries for the World Bank. And Malaysia's 8% per annum growth for the three decades, part of it was a perfect combination of stimulating agriculture, uh, using the housing sector as a driver for growth, and continuing you know, uh, 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 the, the investment they did in oil and others. So I saw what housing could do. And we're also looking at the housing sector now as a key driver for growth. But you need to solve several problems first. We don't have mortgages. We have 20,000 mortgages in a country of the size of Nigeria, of 167 million people. Can you believe that? You know, we don't have a, a good mortgage institutions. So we are creating a Nigerian re mortgage refinance institution to put more liquidity in the system and emit the primary mortgage institutions. We are working on, on, on uh, several land titling, land, land uh, registration, foreclosure policies, all of which have been blocking uh, the housing sector from taking off. And we're doing it by involving 12 states pilot, in a pilot. If they meet certain requirements, they join. And we can kick off mortgages and the housing sector uh, there. And then we will spread it all over the country. This is going to create thousands and thousands and millions of jobs for 
carpenters, plumbers, interior decorators, you name it, uh, we're looking at that. We're also looking at the communications technology. Nigeria is now the third fastest growing um, country for mobile telephony. We have now over 100 million mobile phones from 450,000 that we had uh, in 2002. Can you believe that? And on the back of this, we now have a 38% internet penetration for our youth. And people are now buying, uh, doing uh, shopping on the internet. You know, 100,000 visitors per day on three of our internet sites. So we are seeing a platform that could be attractive to enable us create modern, uh, knowledgeable job, uh, uh, knowledge-based jobs. We're also looking at the creative industries. So we're, we're not leaving any stone unturned. And usually when I talk of the creative industries and I talk of Nollywood, there's a smile. But we don't <laughs> smile anymore because Nollywood is actually creating jobs. It's created a million indirect jobs and uh, 200,000 direct jobs and $250 million in value, according to a World Bank survey. It's all been done from the private sector side and we as government are saying, do no harm, let's not interfere. But what we can do, they told us they have problems with intellectual property uh, rights, they have problems with distribution, and we're trying to look at policies that can positively impact on that. Um, we are also filling in gaps in infrastructure. I'm using my country as an example of the kind of lesson we are learning to drive away this jobless growth. And we've embarked on you know, comprehensive privatization of our power sector. I think once we, it gets the handover happens to the private sector, which we've privatized distribution and generation, uh, keeping transmission, and we're able to um, un unleash that, uh, that we are going to see a significant improvement. 53% of our private sector say that the biggest problem they face is power. It's not corruption. We're expected to see corruption and governance because out here when you say Nigeria, the first word you hear is corruption. But that's not the biggest problem they face. They say the biggest problem is power. The second biggest problem is access to long-term credit. And the third then is corruption and governance issues. And so we need to tackle uh, very critically these issues in order to kick off a, a new kind of transformative system within our economy. Second, it's crucial in our solutions that our youth are not only educated, but the quality of education they receive addresses the skills mismatch. We must develop our human capital on the continent. We need to improve access to basic education, especially for girls and women. I firmly believe that the answer to a lot of our problems on demographics and others is education of girls and women. Let me say that the Nigerian government, led by President Goodluck Jonathan, recognizes this and has made improving both access and quality of education a national priority. We are not at all pleased with the quality of education we have. And I know that many countries are never pleased, but we are particularly not pleased. And of course, Nigerians are voting with their feet and going elsewhere to get an education. But if you don't have the wherewithal to vote with your feet, it means you're condemned to an education system that doesn't work. And that system has to be turned you know, rapidly uh, strongly reformed. And the Minister of Education and her colleagues are focusing on this because this is what we need. We need to get 10.6 million out of school children back in school. We need to improve access and quality. We need to focus like a laser beam on vocational and technical education. And, and all of these things in combination. And we need to focus on our tertiary education. The conditions in which our children learn at the tertiary level are not satisfactory. So we have a big job if we are to solve this problem, you know, to be able to fold into this transformative agenda and, and get away from the issue of jobless growth. Third, we need to build safety nets, social safety nets. This cannot be done without the kind of identity platforms and biometric systems that we are lucky are now available. Technology can make a big difference. I made that point in an article in the FT yesterday just saying that we need to focus hard on some of these systems and processes that can help us solve some of our crucial uh, social problems as well as even corruption uh, problems and governance problems. Using technology can help us better target the poor. It, it's very difficult to target poor people when you don't know who they are. 
when they do not have an identity. And that is what is lacking. You know, people in my country are frustrated because they said not enough is going to the poor. We would like to do it, but we can't target them unless you identify them. Of course, everybody will say we know who the poor are, but when you're doing a social service program, they actually need to be able to say we, this person of this income received these benefits. And until we have these identification systems, uh, we, 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 we don't have it. But we, we, are, we are trying. We are building the social safety net, starting with self-targeting. So we have a conditional cash transfer program that targets pregnant women because it's self-identification. I don't think a man can walk up and say and collect the cash transfer, you know, because they obviously will not be a pregnant man. Um, uh, although I may eat my words, you never know. <laughs> And a woman, even a woman, you know, uh, with these midwives there, it would be hard for them to fake when they're being examined that they're pregnant. So you can't do a program like that for self-targeting. But beyond that, you really need this biometric uh, platform. And so we are starting, but we need to go further. We have a 13 million person platform uh, for biometrics, for identity cards, that we are, we've started running with MasterCard. And I hope we can make it uh, all over the, the country. Fourth, the reality that Africa needs to consider family planning and population growth. This is a topic that is not very popular on the continent, and certainly not popular in my country. And yet we cite China all the time, but we forget that China's much reviled one-child policy was part of its success in, in making 10% per annum economic growth ra eradicate poverty or reduce poverty. I'm not suggesting we follow this, of course, lest I be lynched. But as Africans, we must now begin to look at our own homegrown policies and look at how we manage population growth. We must not shy away from a, a discussion of this topic. It is a very unpopular topic. And indeed, you know, you might almost be lynched by suggesting that we, are, we look at this issue. But we can't get away from it. I believe the key here is also talking about educating girls and women postponing the age of marriage, and several other non-threatening policies that we can put in place that would indeed help us with family uh, planning. I'm coming towards the end. Fifth, while our youth bulge, bulge can be viewed as a threat to our economic development, it can also present unique demographic opportunities and dividends, depending on how we manage it. I propose we see our youth bulge not as a threat, but as a catalyst for economic transformation, as the Asian tigers did. In the 1940s, the Asian tigers, such as South Korea, found themselves in a similar situation that Africa is in today, even 50s and 60s, a very young population, and they built their economies on the backbones of this young labor force. The Korean South developed a program of, edu quote, education for economic growth, focused on investing in skills for the youth to power industrial revolution and economic growth. And they were able to transit from a developing to a developed country by economy, by investing in this young labor force. So if we can properly harness our own youth bulge in the ways, using the strategies I've spelled out, I think we can also see a, a demographic dividend. In the short term, we need to, co to complement all of these with introducing job creating programs, as has been done in this country in the US and elsewhere to try to address the severity of the problem and give the youth hope. Also using my country as an example, very quickly we've done, we are doing that. We have three programs, one for the unskilled, and this is particularly pertinent uh, in the north where we have the emergency program that with some calm, we're able to introduce jobs for the unskilled. We are targeting 370,000 young people. We've already done 178,000, and we're well on our way. We have a program for entrepreneurs. Uh, it's called You Win, Youth Enterprise with Innovation. It's very popular because it's merit-based. You don't need to know anyone in Nigeria. You know, everybody believes you can't get anything unless you know have an aunt, an uncle, or a cousin who can get you a leg in, a foot in the door. This program doesn't need that. You just go on the website, and, and it's been highly successful. The first round we did, it's a business planning competition. And those whose business plans are judged the best get grants of from 10000 7000 to about $70,000. So it's real money to help them either expand their business or try out new ideas. 
24,000 people applied the first time. We weeded them down to 6,000, gave them the business plan training, opened up a one-day uh, business registration desk where we registered all of them because most of them, their businesses were informal. They were not registered. Trained them and then unleashed them to do their business plans and 1,201. But mark you, 6,000 were registered and they didn't know that my ulterior motive as finance minister was also to enlarge the tax base. <laughs> <laughs> so we've done that too. And the last part of the program is a program for unemployed youth. We're targeting 50 unemployed graduates. 50,000 graduates uh, we've started, 1,000 companies registered, and we are placing them in these companies for internships. If a company employs uh, these people, young people after the internship, they get tax breaks. We've placed 1,309. We're just starting, and we have the balance of 45, uh, 46, 47,000 to place. So in summary, in Nigeria, you know, we need a little bit of time because I believe we're really proceeding on the path that all of us African countries should be proceeding on. And we are not the only ones doing it. I mean, other countries have got the message that if we do not deploy, deploy all these transformative approaches to our problems, we are going to end up without an unsecured development, which will not serve anyone. So in summary, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the security of Africa's development is under threat if we do not ar address this rising phenomenon of jobless growth and high youth unemployment. We cannot afford to exclude our young ones from economic opportunities. I do remain optimistic that with the right policies, African countries can continue to harness the potential of their youth, tackle violence and restiveness among their citizens, and ultimately build more inclusive and prosperous societies. To conclude, let me borrow the words of Kofi Annan to say that, quote, no one is born a good citizen, no nation a democracy. Rather, both are processes that continue to evolve over a lifetime. Young people must be included from birth. A society that cuts itself off from its youth, severs its lifeline. It is condemned to bleed to death. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. If I may say so, I thought that a uh, completely captivating lecture, and I've rarely seen such an array of statistics harnessed to such an inspiring narrative. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. We have time for a conversation with you, so I'd like to ask anyone who'd like to ask a question or make a, a comment to, to raise their hands and catch my attention. I've got a few already on my list, but Jens Thorstrup first. Wait till the microphone comes, and then give your name and affiliation if relevant. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for a very inspiring lecture. Um, I wanted to ask you about the role of China in terms of the development of the sub-Saharan Africa and Nigeria in particular and how important you see their role. Okay. Should we take maybe a, a round? I'm happy to take two or three. Yeah. Dana Allen. Yeah, I've got you. Thank you, Minister. It was a very fascinating and inspiring talk. I just wonder... Um, I mean, you spoke early on and throughout of, um, of jobless growth and also the problem of, it, of it, in e unequal growth or inequality. Of course, it's not a problem confined to uh, developing countries. Um, the, the, the recipes that you presented, which sounded very impressive, do seem to come from a kind of World Bank toolkit of, of of, of um, accepted uh, ideas. And I'm just wondering, for this huge problem of inequality, have we abandoned uh, too readily uh, radical alternatives, um, that, you know, Marxist alternatives that were d rightly discredited? But is it necessary to think in big terms about, about inequality? What, what would you suggest? I don't know. I'm asking you. You need uh, examples. That's the problem of what that could be. OK, I'll, I'll talk about it. And, and you, sir, yes? Yes. yes could, you, um, could you stand up, please? Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I'm Christopher Ako, a Nigerian student studying at Oxford. Um, part of the reason for in, um, joblessness is that we export most of our jobs to other countries. Mm -hmm. Nigeria spent um, in 2011 over $8 billion subsidizing the importation of fuel, 
um, refined petrol um, during the fuel crisis, the subsidy crisis in 2012, government came, made so much promises that we're going to um, rechannel the money uh, from the stoppage of subsidy to provide jobs at home. But up till now, we haven't been refining petrol. We still import petrol, and that is exporting jobs to Europe and other countries. So what is the government doing to ensure that those jobs that are exported to foreign countries are brought back home. Thank you. And one more in this round, and Nick Redmond. And yeah, we'll, we'll have another round of four or five, don't worry, I've got you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Minister, um, uh, Nigeria has experienced the mixed blessings of uh, resource uh, abundance and, and, and a resource developed economy, particularly with regard to oil. Um, now that you have uh, neighbors near and far, um, Ghana, but also uh, a, a number of states that you mentioned in, in East Africa, on the cusp of that, what would your advice be to them about how to manage uh, this boom and how to uh, dampen down some of the negative effects? Can we take those four? Yeah. Okay, thank you for some very good questions. Um, on the role of China in sub-Saharan Africa and in, in Nigeria, um, I take maybe a slightly more open perspective on that. Um, there are two things. Uh, first of all, the needs of the continent. The estimates is, is that you know, we have uh, an infrastructure financing gap of north of $50 billion. Uh, uh, after you've taken account of all the other investments coming from governments and so on, uh, a year. And this has to be filled from different sources. If China has the resources to invest uh, to help us build this infrastructure, there's no reason why we should not be open. And now it's up to us to negotiate agreements with them that are transparent and workable for us. I mean, no longer should we not be able in this day and age um, you know, to negotiate those agreements. Actually, I was invited to give a talk to the Chinese Mining Association, uh, you know, three, two years ago, and I was still at the World Bank three years ago. And, um, you know, I, I got into this room and I forgot I was in China. There were 4,000 people, uh, you know, coming to listen to this uh, lecture. And the chair was Li Keqiang, who is now yeah. uh, the prime minister of the country. And I thought to myself, wow, this is a unique opportunity to really give a message that, you know, uh, in Africa, you know, if here are some basic rules of the game of what we are expecting. Openness, transparency, if you're investing in natural resources, even infrastructure, the communities need to know the nature of agreements you enter into and so on. So once we are clear on our criteria, uh, I think we should be welcoming uh, to the Chinese and I think they have a role. Nevertheless, we also need to encourage them to invest in manufacturing and in industry on our continent. This issue of exporting jobs. Uh, so instead of us, you know, the, the buying our textiles and other things, they can set up factories for shoes. And it can happen because uh, Chinese, uh, you know, labor is getting more expensive. Actually, we need to prepare ourselves to be able to provide a welcoming home and platform for some of the industries where the Chinese will no longer be competitive. Um, and I think we can have this kind of relationship with them if we open our eyes and we provide the right environment. Uh, so I see them well managed as a positive force. I see that we need to be very clear on the terms of engagement. And if we do all that, I, I don't see um, uh, the difficulties in, in having China, in Africa, and in Nigeria. And uh, it's not, they're not always just interested in grabbing natural resources. I think sometimes the Chinese have a very long-term agenda as well in building relationships, and this is often missed. Uh, it's not unimportant to them that Nigeria will be the largest economy in Africa uh, in the not-too-distant future, and that they need to build the requisite relationships. So we are also open to that. Um, I think the World Bank toolkit of accepted, well, I don't know if that's what you see. I don't see that. I just see sensible policies. You know, um, I, I don't know what to say, but when I look in my experience of 30 years in development, albeit from the World Bank, 
But if I see good things and good policies that are working, then whether they come from that cool toolkit or from somewhere else, I just see sensible things that we can apply to ourselves. And that is what we are trying to um, No, Those are the policies that I'm talking about. It may have been misunderstood as derogatory. I'm just asking, do you think that's going to solve the inequality problem? I, I don't know if it will totally solve the inequality problem, but it would definitely make a difference. If we diversify our economy, you know, uh, like you look at the economies that are successful. What's the characteristic of these economies? Their characteristic is that they've got a base that is fairly well diversified. If you look at East Asia, even take Malaysia used as an example. When Malaysia found oil, it did not abandon agriculture. It continued to invest in agriculture. It actually even came to Nigeria and took the oil palm and planted it and then started exporting the oil back to us. We abandoned agriculture. So it's not rocket science that if you can maintain those sectors where you have a comparative advantage and use them to create jobs. At the same time, they introduced manufacturing. They were not so successful with automobiles and others, but they did have some success in electronics tied to the Japanese. So I think you know that some of the suggested things will make things better. They may not solve the problem totally. But when we think of the other socialist uh, Marxist alternatives, I'm not really sure. We can look at Venezuela, where an ex this experiment it was being tried. And we've been watching it. I don't think that we in the developing world should stick to one model or the other and be very ideological and doctrinaire. No, we should look for what works. So we're watching Venezuela to see whether that will work. And the problem we saw is that, yes, you're transferring uh, you know, resources to the less fortunate and the poor. But it's not in a way that can stand the test of time. And increasingly, the economy was, you know, growth was decelerating, and it was clear that it was going to come to a stage where it would grant to all. So is that the model? Not sure. I think Brazil, where under Lula, may have been a better example, where he tried to grow the economy, but at the same time to take the surpluses and build strong safety nets. I'm actually quite shocked. We had Lula in Nigeria two months ago. You know, and he reeled off. Start, if you think these statistics are here, you should have listened to Lula. He didn't make one sentence. He just reeled off statistic after statistic of what he had achieved in Brazil. So today, uh, when I saw demonstrators saying, oh, the health system is not so good, and I was actually taken aback, because that's the bedrock of what he thinks he achieved, that he improved education and opened up opportunities for people at the bottom through these cash transfer and the Bosa Familia program and supported family agriculture, improved health. So that just shows you what life is like. I think relative poverty is a serious issue in the world. So sometimes it's not about the fact that you cannot eat. You know, I see people in my country, Nigeria, complaining how badly off they are, and how nothing is happening in this country, how it's all downhill. You know, and then I see them boarding a flight the next day, going to London. I mean, there was actually a case, you know, I saw of someone, a man, who had complained about how you people in government, you're doing nothing, it's all downhill, this economy and country is going nowhere. Uh, you know, I'm worse off. Then I saw him, I was traveling to, to a meeting outside, and he was there with his wife and five children about to board a flight. And uh, so I asked him, I said, I thought you said you were so badly off. No, first I didn't say, I said, where are you going? He said he's coming to London to take a, a vacation with his family. And, and I said, but uh, didn't I hear you saying you were so badly off the other day, so hard to pay school fees? Uh, so I said to him, well, you know, everybody has a different way. You know, in my family, we pay tuition first, we take care of rent or mortgage or whatever, and then we travel. If at the end of everything there's still money left over, then we don't feel so badly off because we've taken care of necessities. In your family, you travel first <laughs> and do all these things, and then when you come back and you can't pay school fees, you say the government is not doing a good job. So I told him all of that, and I've not seen him again. <laughs> you know, so, so it's relative. It's all a relative, pro you know, if you see other people, 
doing things you know even if you're feeding yourself but you can't get the car and you can't travel and you, then you feel oh everything is uh, going to hell in a handbasket <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know the alternative. Sorry, I've been long-winded. But what I'm trying to say is what I like about your question is that it forces you to think, am I just disappearing into some orthodoxy? And I don't think so. It's really born out of what is it that works, doesn't work. And if we see what works, we'll follow it. Then the issue of exporting jobs with fuel subsidies. Now, you know, um, I, I'm going to be a little tough on you in my answer, so please forgive me. One of the questions, uh, issues I have in my country is that you'll be telling people information and they won't listen because they've got a view and they're going to push it. Whether you're Now you asked, what are we doing? We made promises about this money and the subsidies. You're right about one thing. We have not built any refineries because we decided that government has been a failure in building refineries. And we should try and get some private sector people either to partner with us to build those refineries, build themselves. We've been trying. We've given licenses, even more than we had before. They are not they are saying that until we have the right price for the product, they are not really interested in investing. So we are at a conundrum. But Ali Kodangote has recently put forward a plan to build a refinery for 1.8 billion. So let's see if that, but we thought that we shouldn't venture into that. Actually, the Chinese and others have come you know, with loans for refineries. And we thought about it and said, whether it's our own money, their money, if you're willing to invest as an investor, go ahead. But for government to enter it tomorrow, they'll say the money disappeared. This happened. That didn't happen. So I think the price of the product is still not right, correct, right? And therefore, people, private sector is hesitating. But we are working really hard to attract some of them to do that. And one has now, is now going to launch a refinery. Now, for what are we doing with the money? You made so many promises. I don't think you were listening to what I said. Every single month, we publish the amount of money we get from the subsidy in the newspaper. So one, the first thing is for you to know how much money is even coming in for the federal government and for states. Two, we publish what that money is being used for. And right here in this book, you can check and see what is being done with the Shopee money. That's what we call it, Shopee. What is it going for? I just described to, to you a conditional cash transfer program. Develop, you have to look, where are the stresses? It is unacceptable that in our country, Women die from childbirth in far larger numbers than anywhere in the world. So we decided to target some of the money there and to give them 5,000 Naira cash transfers. When you come, if you come for prenatal checkup, you get 2,000. If you have an attended birth, you get another 2,000. If you bring your child for immunization, you get another 1,000. We have a program called Saving One Million Lives. And we've saved 400 and something thousand out of that. And we are targeting one million by 2015. The names of every recipient by word is electronically captured. So people should not tell me, oh, nobody, we don't know who is getting it. You can check. That's where your money is going. And I think it's a good thing. Because I've been a woman, I've been pregnant, and I almost died in childbirth. So it's personal to me. It's a good way to use Shopee money. The second thing is that we've identified the roads that we've put the money in, the rail, and we can give it to you. So you can check. So this business that government is using the money and they are not keeping their promises is simply not true. We are keeping our promise. You can check what we are doing. And the only thing we've not done is build that refinery. You're right on that, and I've told you why. So I feel very strongly about this, because even when you're doing, you know, the people don't even want to say, check the truth. So that's that. <laughs> <laughs> And then, you know, we, we are very much sort of worried about this export of jobs. And that's the right question. That's why I said all these things, that we are cognizant. That's what makes us lose sleep if young people like yourself cannot get jobs. So we are trying all these approaches and strategies to really create jobs and not export again. You know, not to be buying goods from China, not to be spending 10 billion on agricultural imports, but to produce. 
and it's beginning to work. So that's the, the news I have for you, that you will see it rolling out. On the issue of how to manage natural resources, actually, we were in the G8 meeting on Saturday, and the president of Ghana was there, you know, and he was asked a similar question. And, you know, he said, we've learned lessons, and he looked at me from our neighbors in Nigeria, you know, of, of uh, what, what not to do. And then he quickly added, and what to do. <laughs> <laughs> So we've had quite a bit of exchange of information, even with the finance minister, and they've learned well. Things that we didn't lock in, and now with all the sort of tension in Nigeria and all the complexity of the country, it's a little bit difficult. Like locking in how you will manage resources in the first place. It took us how many decades of having oil? Five decades before we realized that managing the volatility of oil prices is crucial and that until we get a handle on it, we won't be going anywhere. You know, before, if you look at our pattern of growth for the past, it's a zigzag, and that's why we weren't going anywhere. Because when oil prices were high, we spent everything and built white elephant projects. When they were low, we crashed, and we couldn't even pay salaries. And you know, there's a beautiful chart in this book, my book, I don't have a copy, but the gentleman there has it. If you go to the back, you see this chart of what Nigeria's economic growth, expenditure pattern, revenues, and GDP growth, very volatile. Then we put in place this mechanism in 2004 of an oil price-based fiscal rule, which is a fancy name for saying that you detach the price at which you budget from the ongoing market price so that you can have a smoothing out of your consumption and expenditure patterns. They, we shared all that with them, and they quickly made a law locking in how the benchmark price would be set, which we didn't do. And we are suffering from it today because it's become a little bit political. When you want to set the benchmark, people will tell you no. We have a model for doing it, but then you know, legislators will say no, it shouldn't be 75, it should be 80, and things like that. They've locked it in so we've, with a law. And, and they've learned a lot of things that we shared openly with them. So um, and on a daily, Basis. The Minister of uh, Finance will be coming to Nigeria in a couple of weeks, and we exchange a lot of information. We too, we try to learn. Even as we share lessons and they come up with new systems, we also look. They phased out oil subsidies the other day in Ghana, and nobody rioted. Mm. <laughs> but if it's in my country, it's a different issue. Okay. Can we take two quick ones? Uh, look, you, you, could, you could have 20. Uh, the, the, the lady in the back, yes, if you could stand up. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, the question I want to ask is about strategic initiatives. Uh, you talked about the fact that you're giving uh, pregnant women 5,000 naira. Is those kind of things that worry us as intellectuals? Because I know giving a, a pregnant woman 5,000 naira is not going to solve any problem. Because in Nigeria, as we are today, 5,000 Naira is not even going to take you for two hours. What we need, those women, what they need is to be able to walk into an hospital and know that they will get the right kind of treatment at the right time. And so we're, we're not seeing those strategic initiatives. There's that trust deficit between the government and the people when we hear things like that. Recently in Nigeria, the cutoff mark for national common entrance was 10 over 100 in some states. That's 10%. A student that gets 10% is going to get into the secondary school. And you're wondering, what is the strategic direction of the minister, Ministry of Education? So, ma'am, what we want to know is what are the challenges that are stopping the government from putting in place those kind of initiatives that will give the people confidence that there is a long-term plan to make the economy a better place. Thank you. I have a, a second from there. I, I won't be able to take everybody, but this, this person there, thank you. Please go ahead. Shagun Kubanjo from UBS Wealth Management. Um, one of the most common questions my clients ask me is about access to affordable capital. Some economies have successfully used export credit agencies and guarantees to facilitate access to capital and by extension, trade and industrialization. Are there plans to do the same in Nigeria? And then there was another one back there, yes. Yeah, I think 
The one in the very back row, and I'm afraid that'll be the, the last question because the minister has an engagement in about seven minutes. Yeah. Thanks very much. I'm Nana Ampofo with Songhai Advisory. Um, I was interested to hear about the plans to emphasize housing development in uh, Nigeria's um, economic uh, 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 plan. So I just wanted to ask, to what extent do you see the same skills gap that you described as being a blockage there? Imagining that the finance is on hand, to what extent is the, skills, is the lack of skills going to slow that down? And what role will the, the region play in the sense that Ghanaian labor is coming across? And they're kind of linked to that. Do, you see that. do you see that being a source of tension? If Ghana has the skills and Ghanaians are turning up to build Nigerian uh, uh, homes and the such, is this something that, that could be a source of tension? Thank you. OK, thank you again for a good set of questions. Um, the lady that raised the issue of the fact that 5,000 Naira is not going to create uh, or solve the problem and strategic uh, initiatives uh, that we're involved in. I think, um, y y let me describe to you, I mentioned the cash transfer. You see, Nigerians said we don't have safety nets. Go and look at what Brazil is doing. We brought Lula. We listened to what he had to say and how he managed to solve the problem of what's going on in Brazil. And uh, we, the people have found it good. And we are trying to do those, follow similar policies. But I told you we have a problem because we don't have identification. So we started with something that is a basic problem in the, in the society. You may not think that the 5,000 matters. But what we are trying to do with it, we are not saying 5,000 is going to solve your problems for life. But we are saying, as they did in Brazil, that a woman who is pregnant and does not have an attended birth, this is why the women are dying in remote rural areas. I lived in the remote, such remote rural areas in the north in 1979 when I was doing research for months. And you know, some of these places, there's no access road. Talk of a hospital. You're talking, we can't build hospitals in every community in the country. So you have to come out with strategic ideas of how you still attend to those people. Even in this uh, UK, every little village does not have a hospital. They have regional, district, and so on, isn't it? So those places, you have to have some kind of service. And if you don't yet have roads, you don't want the women there to die. So it is very strategic to me that we developed a midway free service of women willing to go and live in those villages. And that midwifery service just won the Commonwealth Award as one of the best innovations recently. 3,000 women uh, trained, 9,000 health workers willing to go inside. And what we're saying is sometimes even when you have them, the husbands, depending on the culture, may not even allow them to come and take advantage of that midwife who is sitting in some small facility in the village or to allow the person to be called. I'm taking time with this because it's important for her to understand that saving one million lives is strategic. <clears throat> so what we found that if you have a cash transfer to the family or to the woman, the husband's eyes suddenly open. <laughs> and that to me is very strategic because it's going to enable that midwife to save that woman from dying. So I disagree with you on that one. I think it's a very strategic initiative. Every woman we can save. Saving a woman doesn't mean they must be in hospital. Because we are accepting that we cannot have a 1,000 hospitals built everywhere overnight, we are saying what are the other strategies that other countries deploy to get services to their population. And this is one of them. So I hope you're with me. So the idea is not let's give them 5,000 Naira to solve their problem of poverty. That's not what we're doing. We're saying let's give them this cash transfer so that husbands who are stopping the women, not because they want their wives to die, but it's just a cultural thing. But when they see that money, sometimes they say, go and collect that 2,000. In doing that, they either uh, they allow the midwife to examine the woman, to take care, to attend the birth. So do you follow what we're doing? It's a very strategic initiative. It's worked in other countries, and that's why we're doing it. So that's what we are trying to do. Now we have to couple that with longer term approaches that try to bring a road to those villages. Because that means that those women can get out. That tries to develop a district hospital nearby. And it's not only federal government. The states have to do their part. They get half of the resources in the country. 
And by the way, some states have done very well. You have some states in the West like Ondo and so on that has made, because he's a physician, the governor, he's made providing health care a very big part of his agenda. So just to let you know the, the, the way uh, that we're t saying, the trust deficit is definitely there in Nigeria like in every other country. We shouldn't pretend it's not otherwise. And that is why in Nigeria, the population has for a long time not seen delivery from its government in all sorts of ways. And that's why the skepticism factor is also very high. And that means the government, any government faces a challenge. And this particular one faces enormous challenges. But we can only create that trust by steadily working. And I tell you that when we went to do this midterm and we reeled off what has actually been done, not what is going to, and we provided evidence that you can check, I think people began to think again. Now, on the issue of the cutoff mark, appalling, you know, everybody, when they saw this, was asking, what are they about? Are we now doing cutoff marks by state? Shouldn't we have some national standard? That's why we, I said that we are very, did you hear what I said? We are, people are normally dissatisfied with the education systems everywhere. I hear complaints, even when I was living in the US. But we are particularly dissatisfied because sometimes something is announced that you don't know the rationale. Why would you have cut off mark by states or zone? You know, we need a national standard. You know, it's either 50% is a cut off mark everywhere. You know, it's not. So I agree with you completely that that's not the right approach. And we, that thing must be reviewed and, and checked. Um, access to affordable uh, capital. Now, we, this is a, a very good question. You know, I, as I said, I wrote this piece in FT about institutions. The more you look at the difference between us and the developed countries, the more you see clearly as all economists have long said, that is the absence of institutions. But build, it's not that people in the developed countries are more honest or any less corrupt. If they had opportunities and the institutions were not in place, I'm sure funny things would also happen. <laughs> but if you put institutions in place and you couple it with the rule of law and with checking impunity, then the right things begin to happen. And the simple answer is that we, have not, we are not doing those things well. We lack institutions. So I'm giving this long lecture because one of, one of the things I think that will stop our growth from being sustainable is the access, ab absence of things like finance for housing. You know, then people start fiddling. How am I going to have a room over my head, a roof over my head? And they start looking, going for, those who are honest will go for endless training. <laughs> on the civil and save all their per diem, you know, to pay for housing. And those who are not honest will fiddle things. You see what I'm saying? So you've got to give them an institution that will enable them to walk in and borrow decently, like anybody. Similarly, if you don't have access to affordable finance to invest in your company, what do you do? It leads to when you feel against the war. So we're solving it in Nigeria. This is one of the good news I have for you. So we actually decided to build a development finance institution. And surprisingly, there's so much enthusiasm from others to help us. KFW of Germany is Germany's very effective development finance institution. They've offered to help us. The World Bank, the IFC, the BNDS of Brazil, they are sending as we speak on uh, July 1st. A delegation from the, this is how enthusiastic. Once they heard we were keen, they're sending people to us from BNDS on the 1st of July to come and work with us and share experiences. And of course, we'll take the good ones and leave the bad ones behind. <laughs> and of course, the Development Bank of South Africa, these people are even ready to invest. So we will build an institution that will wholesale 10 to 15 year money. It's going to take us 18 months to two, to two years in my view. And once we can establish that, this problem that you're talking about won't completely go away, but will be greatly mitigated. And the last question of lack of skills. Um, you have hit the nail on the head. We lack these skills in Nigeria. Um, you know, the plumbers, the carpenters. In Nigeria, the mentality is that being a plumber is on the way to be getting white collar work. Nigerians do not think 
that being a plumber and a carpenter and all this is real work. You know, we have a mentality, it's only white collar work that is good. So we lack those skills. We are also very willing to compromise. You know, I was building a house and the, 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 the um, builder put the staircase. Uh, my husband and I were building a house in the village. The stair and when we came, we saw that this staircase was crooked. You, you see what I'm saying? The steps were not straight. You know, and one wall was also looking strange. <laughs> you know, we came from Washington. We'd been building this house over 12 years with our little savings. Now, my husband said, look, these steps don't look straight. And you know, they're, and you know, and, and I said, yeah, you know, this is not acceptable. You know what he said to me? He said, ah, madam, manage it now. <laughs> That's a typical Nigerian expression, manage it. Uh -uh. You're too demanding. Women, they're like that. And I said, well, I wasn't the first to say it. My husband said it first. And we are not managing it. <laughs> you know, so excellence in artisanship is not there. You know, so even as we launch this housing sector, we are thinking exactly of what is. So you have Ghanaians. Eventually, in desperation, we did get a Ghanaian builder <laughs> who came in and said we had to remove the steps and remove almost everything these people had done. Otherwise, it wasn't going to build a house. So here is the tragedy that we are lacking in these jobs. But we don't have our people interested in excellence. So Togo, Ghana, and Benin supply the carpenters and the builders. And that has to be changed. So even as we are planning this housing sector, we are working closely with some companies, including some uh, South African. You know, who uh, we are developing a program for training in a massive way for these skills and then in unleashing them so they train and you know we train and then they wander around looking for what to do we are going to train and put them onto building these houses so that is the way we'll solve it and i do not think we will have tension most of the people working now you know on these jobs are really from the region the ones who are doing a good job and they can't even keep up with the demand <coughs> so i anticipate um hopefully I know Nigerians are causing tension in Ghana, but I don't think Ghanaians. <laughs> I know Nigerians are making housing prices go up and all sorts of other tensions, but you're very welcome in Nigeria. You know, it's a large country, so we can absorb so many people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Okonga Wala, thank you very much. I was very lucky to sit beside you in Munich, but I feel even luckier to have been with you for the last uh, two hours here. You've absolutely enchanted and informed uh, this audience. This audience includes, I hope, some 30 or 40,000 people that have tuned into our website oh, as we really? webcast this live. So uh, your message is being sent to many more people than you see here, but the people here are very lucky to have seen you in person. Thank you very much for being at the Double and giving this Oppenheimer lecture. Such a long journey we go.